participants and viewers who are listening to our translation and broadcast. My name is Daniel Labanova. I'm the uh, Deputy Executive Director at the Gorchikov Fund. We are holding a traditional discussion uh, topics that are relevant for the international agenda together with the uh, Arctic Development Project Office. We are organizing this roundtable on the topic of the Northern Sea Route, the International Transport Corridor and its capacity. The topic is uh, well known. Uh, there's no need to justify why we find it relevant. It is something that we discuss. It is important for Russia, for the international community. And uh, we'll have to discuss a number of issues that we'll, um, you know, we'll go over. We are including them in our overview of the agenda. We are really appreciative to all of the experts who decided to join us who are going to speak today on the topic. I would like to introduce the moderators of our meeting today. Uh, Igor Pavlovsky, Director of uh, Expert Center of the Project Office for Arctic Development and at the same time a member of the Gorchakov Club, an all-time member of our programs, and Nana Garokova, a Public Relations Director of the Alexander Gorchakov Public Diplomacy Fund, and she's also an expert in the uh, topics of the Arctic. Uh, she has been writing on this topic a lot. Mr. Pavlovsky, I give you the microphone. Hello, dear participants, dear uh, viewers of the broadcast, discussing the importance of the Northern Sea Route um, is equal to uh, discussing the importance of uh, international transit corridors. Everyone is uh, talking about this, uh, discussing both the pros and cons of this. Russia has been uh, holding residency in the Arctic Council uh, over the last year, and this brings the topic to a new height, to a new level. We're doing this together with the experts of the Gorchakov Fund to discuss this topic in the international realm and uh, in the international context. How important is this topic, um, how well can we develop um, this uh, shipping route for uh, supporting uh, international shipping and for supporting Russia's economic interests. We'll try to uh, do it within a matter of an hour, an hour plus. Uh, I know that everyone is busy, but of course, after the round table is over, we will publish uh, the results on the Gorchakov's website and uh, on our website of the uh, project office for Arctic Development. I hope that I have not uh, mixed things up. I'm giving you the floor now. No, you haven't mixed things up. would like to welcome all of the international experts, our distinguished participants who decided to participate. It's going to be a multifaceted discussion. We are confident that's the way it's going to be. I'm not going to talk too much time, um, and I will give uh, the floor to Mr. Gudev, Pavel Gudev, he is the Senior Research Fellow, Sector of U.S. Foreign and Diplomatic Policy at Imam Res. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. It's great to see you all in good health. In uh, early June, I uh, had the COVID and I'm feeling much better now. It wasn't easy uh, at first. And hopefully things are going to get better. I will start with the provocative uh, thesis. I will uh, expand on it at the end of my speech. I will just identify it. On It's not just my own opinion, but the international law of the seas says that the development of the uh, potential of the sea route and its current legal status are not two compatible things with one exception, there are two types of transit, the internal domestic transit when we carry something from the Kamchatka Peninsula to the Baltic Sea or to St. Petersburg, and there's also international transit when we carry things from China, let's say, to Western Europe or to the United States. In the, in the latter case, uh, this uh, use of the Northern Sea Route is incompatible with the latter goals. I will explain what I mean by this. I'm always skeptical about various numbers. You know, we have the uh, goal for 2024 to ship 80 million, and by 2030, this number should be 30 million tons of cargo shipped across the Northern Sea Route or NSR. They are quite ambitious. And uh, whenever I hear that the Northern Sea uh, Route is a replacement of the Suez, 
uh, canal. It's a problem because people that say this, they uh, have two problems. Well, they try to, uh, you know, bring a their own thinking to the certain global problem, and at the same time, they they try to take things lightly. We are talking about numbers that are very difficult to achieve. Even if we reach the number of 80 million or 120 million, we are talking about the transit numbers. But I'm really uh, concerned that nobody's uh, saying that what's going to be the part of the transit we're talking about in these 80 million tons, how much uh, of that transit will be internal, domestic Russian transit. And uh, another question comes up in 2019, we shipped from Kamchatka to Murmansk and St. Petersburg, one major shipment of uh, Far Eastern ship, uh, fish rather, and uh, that, was, that was about half a million tons. That's not much. Um, and so the main question is, what are we going to ship back to the Kamchatka? We have this uh, last ship, uh, uh, Northern Sea Route. It um, made one trip, one voyage from uh, Murmansk to St. Petersburg, but it was empty on the way back. So we need to have a proper model. Everyone understands that the key restriction and limiter on shipping cargoes across the Northern Sea Route is the fact that it's not operated all year round. And we want to make it a all year round northern shipping route. And that's something that shouldn't be a problem. We will build a significant number of icebreakers. And others are saying, and some people are saying that this is just a hypothesis and others are saying this is a fact, the Arctic is getting warmer and that will uh, melt the ice. But I'm a lawyer and there's article 234 of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. Uh, that talks about ice-covered areas that gives preemptive rights to control shipping uh, for the purpose of uh, fighting pollution in the areas where ice is present most of the year. Let's say uh, the Arctic gets warmer and there's less ice there, and so this article is not going to work anymore or will not more work as much as it should. So we are talking about uh, a whole set of various legal arguments. And sometimes just one legal argument can be the underpinning of all the other ones. And if it goes away, everything will crumble. And our opponents will say that we no longer have those opportunities for regulating the NSR. I believe that uh, there are climatic changes and uh, climate change may be cyclic and uh, maybe later on things will get colder, but uh, who knows? And an important and fact to consider is that the uh, US Coast Guard gets uh, funding for building their first ice breakers. They want to build six to 11 icebreakers of different kinds. I don't know whether this is something that will be supported by the Biden administration, but it's a paradox. Most experts are saying that the Arctic is getting warmer, but the Americans are gonna build icebreakers. Why would they build icebreakers if the Arctic is getting warmer? And the same question should be addressed to our experts. And uh, speaking about container shipments, there is a project to expand container shipping across the Northern Sea Route. We're talking about container shipping as a multimodal type of shipping where you use other types of transportation, railway and uh, road transportation. And uh, if uh, you have difficult ice situation on the Northern Sea Road, uh, they're not gonna be able to uh, pick up the cargo on time because the important concept of shipping is just in time. It's not gonna work here. Another rule that it works here is that we're gonna ship something from China to the Western Europe, but what are we gonna ship back? Are there any cargoes that can be shipped by containers from Western Europe to China? And you also need to understand, it is quite important to understand that China is the absolute leader in terms of uh, container shipping, 20% of the market. And 20% of uh, shipments from uh, China uh, is uh, their share of the market. We are behind uh, 
uh, them behind other shipping. You know, there is a project that is being discussed that we will do something together with the United Arab Emirates, but I'm skeptical. I'm not sure whether this is something that can be done. Now, Mr. Grigoryev uh, um, is a great expert on the economics of the Northern Sea Route. He's saying that it is possible to have uh, back and forth there uh, with the icebreaker uh, in the lead, followed by a tanker ship and then by some lash ship. But the question is, what are we going to ship and where? Now, let's talk about the legal aspects. Well, we need to authorize civilian ships to go through the NSR. And this is based on the presumption that the Russian Arctic uh, Straits uh, near the Novosibirsk Island and others are considered by us as the internal waters on the legal and historical grounds. There cannot be other uh, modes of shipping through those areas other than those based on authorizations. But the Americans are saying that these are international straits with the right for international transit. And they should apply equally to military ships, naval ships, and to civilian ships. And the Americans are saying that the most important criteria is the criteria of geography. The convention is saying that if the uh, straits are connecting one part of the exclusive economic zone to the other, or one part of the open sea to the other, that's our situation, then such Straits are considered to be international, but they are saying that the most important function is their functionality, whether they're used for international shipping or not. If such transit is there, if it goes through those straits, if it's not internal, but it is international, it's going to be more difficult for us to protect the uh, Russian status of this, uh, Russian control status of these straits, and therefore that will put at risk the overall legal regime that exists there. I don't want to be either the optimist or the pessimist, but if there is a goal, it will have to be implemented. And then of course, we will have to deal with the issue of liberalizing the regime of going through the Northern Sea Route. That's where I would like to stop right now. Thank you very much for your very mm, emotional and passionate start of our discussion. I'm sure that will generate a lot of questions. But now let us not stop and give the floor to our colleague from Norway, Arild Mu. He's the senior research fellow at the uh, Fritjö of Nansen Institute who studies the future of the Northern Sea Route from the standpoint of uh, international uh, transit. Who would like to find out what uh, our foreign experts think about the Arild? The floor is yours. Well, we cannot hear you. You're probably on mute still. Thank you. This is a multifaceted issue, of course. And uh, we already see uh, a number of very important elements. And I'm going to continue talking about one of them which was uh, mentioned by our first uh, speaker, Pavel Gutev. I'm talking about the opening of the sea route for navigation for shipping through the entire length of this route. This is one of the interesting factors, but only one. I will now switch to English because I prepared a short uh, report on this, a short presentation on this. Ice breaking and year on the navigation is, is something that is tied together, not least in an official Russian expectation, as, as mentioned by Pavel Gudev. Uh, but uh, transit has, in a way, faded uh, from the horizon over the last few years, at least for the time being. What has happened is, of course, that the successful completion of Yamal LNG and then the Noviport oil projects demonstrated that the potential for resource extraction with maritime logistics was much greater than thought just 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was much more talk about transits. Whereas now, uh, it has become clear that international transit shipping is not taking off. 
as anticipated in 2010-2012. So, as we all know, the, the focus now is very ambitious plans for development of resource projects along the Siberian coast. This new goal is to establish year-round navigation on the NSR, including towards the east, and establish year-round navigation to facilitate exports to Asian markets. To do this requires a substantial increase in the number of icebreakers, as well as investments in other infrastructure. It is clear that international shipping companies will not start to seriously consider using an NSR for transit unless stable year-round navigation has been established. This means that the development of infrastructure for destinational shipping becomes a key condition for development of international transit shipping. As we know, the ice situation is getting lighter. This has made it possible to extend the navigation season on the NSR considerably, only in the course of the last five, six years. The question is now what it will cost and what it is worth to have the NSR navigable all the way, also in the remaining five, six months per year. That is in the period January to June. Current Russian plans and proposals for the nuclear icebreaker fleet include five 60 megawatt icebreakers, the first of which was completed last year, and 320 megawatt icebreakers, the leader class. The construction of the first leader started in 2020. Altogether, the construction costs amount to some 600 billion 2019 rubles, which would be approximately 9.5 billion US dollars. I think this is a, a conservative assessment. And to this, some should be added capital costs. In a recent deep deployment plan, Rosatom places all the nuclear icebreakers east of Dixon. This means that all this icebreaking capacity will only serve the traffic that goes eastward from this point. According to Rosatom, in the period 2025 to 30, cargo shipped eastwards on the NSR to the Asian market will grow to 20 million tons annually, compared to 60 million tons shipped westwards to Europe. After 2030, Rosatom believes cargo flows eastward should increase to 70 million tons. An overwhelming share of this cargo will be LNG from projects in the Obey area. According to the gas company Novatec, sending LNG eastwards to Asian markets via a transshipment facility to be built in Kamchatka represents a very substantial saving compared with the Western route. However, the specially designed ice-breaking LNG carriers for Yamal LNG and Arctic LNG2 and other planned LNG projects will not require ice-breaking assistance for the whole year. And most likely, they will only pay for ice-breaking part of the year. The question then is how much income will the icebreakers generate? According to my calculations, if almost all the saved shipping costs are used to pay for icebreaking, it would only cover operating costs and parts of the capital costs of the icebreaker fleet. This means that the financing, financing the construction of the icebreakers will remain a state task and not covered by income from escorts and icebreaker services. Cargo owners other than Novatec may also be interested in the Eastern route. Indeed, in the cargo scenarios for NSR, it is assumed that a series of export-oriented projects 
will be implemented, some of which will target Asian markets. But whereas it can be attractive to sail east in the ice-free season, it may be more costly when icebreaking and payment of accompanying fees is required. Some cargo is not time sensitive and may be stored until the ice melts. We can also not assume that the expected projects always will have a better market in Asia than in the Atlantic Basin. So the outlook is sort of uncertain about the income. As of today, the Russian government's willingness to sponsor icebreaker construction has seemed limitless. However, if the overall economic situation becomes more challenging, trade-offs in budget allocations are likely to become visible and contentious. If the development of most of the new icebreakers is explained with, by improved markets for LNG, exports, and these improvements appear marginal, then it will be asked if the heavy state investments are justified. If international prices for LNG are less than expected, Novotec may negotiate for lower escort fees. Technological improvements in the next generation of ice-breaking LNG carriers could reduce the need for ice-breaker support further. Such developments could result in a re-evaluation of the icebreaker program, which would also have consequences for the conditions for year-round transit shipping. As the idea today is that uh, by building year-round transport uh, transit capacity, tra excuse me, by building year-round navigation capacity for uh, for supporting destinational shipping, will make it attractive also to use the route for international transit. So if the reasoning for building year-round transit for destinational shipping is disappears or is reduced, then of course, uh, logically, it will be less attractive for transit shipping. Well, I have talked now only about ice breaking, and uh, uh, I would very, 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 very much like to emphasize that what I've said does not mean that the possibility of year-round navigation is the only prerequisite for development of internal transits. There are many other factors that will impact decisions in the, national, in the international shipping industry. And I think probably good, you have very well represented some other key constraints. But the message, main message from my presentation is that international transits will not automatically boom even if year-round navigation is established. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was very interesting to listen to the international speakers, and we are discussing that uh, within Russia, whether the Northern Sea Route is uh, capable of performing it uh, transit uh, functions, international transit, uh, that's a separate topic, but for the Russian economy, for the domestic economic situation, I'd like to ask a quick question to Dmitry Tunkin. Actually, a year ago, we discussed that in St. Petersburg, whether the Northern Sea Route could be used to carry goods uh, within the country, within Russia, whether we are supposed to set up a series of hubs in order to carry goods to the north and to the far east. And you said they're interested in three hubs, uh, Primorsk, Murmansk, and uh, Kamchatka. Anything has changed? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you so much for your invitation to take part in the conference. That's a very interesting topic, a very relevant one. Really, last year, we discussed that issue. And we said that we are planning to set up uh, three hubs. Uh, Primorsk, Murmansk, and uh, Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsk in Primorsk. We already developed uh, a full set of uh, design documents. We have uh, designed the biggest uh, container terminal with a turnover of about uh, 3 million TOE, and we are embarking on uh, construction. As for the 
terminal container uh, container terminals in uh, Murmansk and Petropavlovsk. We have uh, made the pre-feed, and at the moment we are missing one very important initial input, something which we have to take into consideration during the feed process. The type of the vessel which is going to be used for the Northern Sea route. We conferred in our leading design documents, R&D, institutions which are specializing in uh, the development of new types of vessels, and they preliminary informed us that the, um, for instance, the container vessels or carriers similar to the ones which uh, navigate uh, uh, the ice-free areas would cost three times more because of the ice class. And we as the designers realize that this is a huge problem for further development and designing because it would trigger the problem of uh, designing the infrastructure, the mooring points, the depths uh, and the technological equipment, uh, that's another problem. We run into the one more problem. Many, actually, uh, companies in the world are producing equipment for huge uh, container carriers, but the production capacity is not so huge. And therefore, it would not maintain the needs of all the terminals which are about to be built. For instance, we are negotiating with the different suppliers in order to reduce the supply and delivery terms. And uh, sometimes uh, the delivery terms are not about uh, nine months, but rather a couple of years. The equipment which could be used for the Northern Sea Route, actually, we do not understand what kind of uh, equipment we're going to operate. And the equipment supplies also are not knowledgeable about the uh, features, uh, the parameters of the vessel and the cranes which are to be used there. So it means that we run into the problem that we are missing input data for further development and designing of the terminals which are to be established along the northern sea route. We can design some conventional terminal, but it will not meet uh, the prospective uh, strategy for the development of uh, uh, the Northern Sea Route and probably will not be capable of uh, carrying the terminal or the containers which could emerge in future. Taking a question, we have developed a concept. We have uh, shared the hubs where it would be feasible to build the terminals, but unfortunately we are missing one of the most important factors or um, we cannot design the type of the vessel. If any designers are taking part in our conference, they would understand what I'm speaking about and uh, would agree with me that we are still missing this piece of data. At least to actually, we failed to come to an agreement with the R&D Institute, which is designing uh, the vessels for the Northern Sea Route and for the Arctic region. I have a quick question, actually. Did you do any calculations about the trade turnover, about the cargo turnover? So, as for the cargo is concerned, so these are either our subsoil resources or LNG, but uh, what could be carried without the use of the hubs, which you spoke about? Well, Igor, I would be quite evasive addressing this question. That's really a commercial secret. The cargo turnover of the Northern Sea Route may cause lots of questions as to what we're going to carry. But in essence, there are clients who are very much interested in this new route, Sea Route. And colleagues said that there is news that uh, uh, a container Arctic line is to be arranged with uh, the Arab Emirates. So it means that there is some interest aroused by this project. That means that uh, developing the feasible study, we have to take consideration not only the capital cost, but also the payback period. Uh, we have certain calculations. Let me put it like that. Thank you so much. 
along with us is Alexei Petrov, uh, who is responsible for the Arctic routes. I can see him. Okay. And before we're joined by one expert from Canada, also a very interesting story about the Northwest Passage and uh, the legal regulation, let me ask a question to Pavel Ivankin. I'm a reporter on that. That's why let me be very provocative. Actually, we have Trans-Siberian route. Why actually we're not using that? Why we are thinking about this new project? And Baikal Amur um, road, that's another main line. Why not using that? Well, in essence, under the current conditions, uh, the Baikal Amur route uh, is almost fully utilized. And until we are betting on coal and calling coal carrying, we it would be a stretch, I would say, uh, to say that uh, Baikal Amur or Trans Siberian route is uh, the only way from the west to the east. Uh, actually, the turnover in terms of uh, how many containers we're carrying by railway is growing in double digit pace and next year it will grow by 15 percent and in order to develop the transit capacity in russia we will need support we will need subsidies and the latest development showed that uh, natural disasters may put on hold any route any highway including by Kalamur route. So we need some standby or some reserve capacity. So Northern Sea Route, this is an additional opportunity for the development for delivering goods apart from Tri-Siberian Route. Thank you so much. Anna, I think that now we'll move to another hemisphere, Frederick Labar, lecturer at Royal Military College of Canada. First of all, Frederick, let me welcome you. Secondly, could you tell us about the position of Canada regarding the nor Northwest Passage uh, through the archipelago? We know that you have your own legal issues and questions as you how manage this passage, this route. And a quick question, probably it may sound quite naive, but Northwest Passage and Northern Sea Route, can they become a kind of bridge between Russia and Canada? Can we cooperate uh, based on that? And are our countries ready for that? And uh, we'll actually rule out Suez, the Suez Canal. We'll move cargo only these ways. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for welcoming me. I'm sorry, uh, I just got off the train and so my Russian is a little bit rusty. Uh, I'm here in Germany, actually. I'm in the same hemisphere, actually. Um, so thank you very much for having me, Igor. Uh, glad to see you, even if it's only in two dimensions, everybody. And uh, uh, hopefully we will meet in three dimensions very, very soon. Um, I, I was asked to present briefly about the uh, Canadian Arctic policy. And uh, the first thing I should say when we talk about Russian-Canadian relations through the Arctic uh, or about the Arctic, uh, we have to remember that uh, your ambassador, Mr. Mamedov, uh, 11 years ago, suggested that there should be um, a perhaps a ferry service going between uh, Murmansk or Akhangalsk and uh, Churchill, Manitoba, which seems uh, far-fetched, but actually it is the sort of cooperative venture which is... The, the sort of thing that Canadians are generally receptive of. For instance, a ferry service, while it would take several days, would still actually get you uh, across to Europe and uh, on the undiscovered part of Europe as well, So, uh, as far as Canadians are concerned. So it was not, it, it was not a, a, a bad idea. The, the thing with the idea is that, of course, at the time and since then as well, we remain with very, very lukewarm, if not very cold relationships because, uh, because of our relationship with NATO, our membership in NATO, should I say, and what we think that Russia has done uh, elsewhere in Europe. 
And so that colors our relationship very, very badly. Um, and unfortunately, uh, many have thought, well, perhaps there's a reason why the, the Russians are suggesting such an idea. For instance, well, if you're going to have a ferry route, well, you'll need to protect that route or you'll need to open, uh, open up the route from, um, for, because of the ice, for instance. And what better machine to do it than a nuclear icebreaker from Russia? Now, that would mean that eventually there would be uh, icebreakers from Russia penetrating into waters that are thought to be Canadian waters. Of course, this is a big dispute, not only with Russia, but with the United States as well, sometimes with Denmark uh, and other uh, countries that seek a passage uh, west uh, while the ice is supposedly, and I say supposedly, melting. Uh, it is not melting at the rate that the experts have been predicted, so it is going to be a long while before that passage is an effective competitor to the passage that you have north of Russia. So uh, in that regard, I think that there's a long status quo that will, in, that will endure. What is actually of greater importance, I would say, is that after the, uh, the, ten, the 2015 uh, defeat of the conservative government in Canada, a conservative government that was really, really serious about displaying sovereignty in the Arctic, uh, we have exactly the polar opposite with Mr. Trudeau right now on the basis that we need to protect the climate and we need to protect the environment, even though uh, protecting the environment means not exploiting the, um, the, the riches of the Arctic. For instance, let me give you a few numbers uh, when it comes to Canada. We are the fourth largest oil producer in the world, uh, or 10% of the world's reserves. We are the, the third largest oil exporter, although 98% of that goes to the United States. And we are the fourth largest gas producer. And we're sixth in terms of gas exports. But we are the world's leading in potassium produce, uh, production. We're fifth in cadmium and cobalt, diamonds, gemstones, gold, graphite, uh, iridium, nickel, niobium, platinum, and uh, titanium as well. As well as uranium, as you all know. <laughs> uh, but what is most important here is nickel and cobalt. If you think about climate change or climate protection, you will realize that things like graphite, uh, cobalt, and nickel are very, very, very important in the creation of batteries for electric cars. Right now, there's a small lobbying effort against electric cars on the basis that the, 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 um, uh, the exploitation of resources needed for the manufacturing of batteries is so damaging to the environment. But since most of those uh, resources are actually gotten out of Africa, we're actually spinning it in a humanitarian um, uh, narrative. We're saying, well, we shouldn't have children mine cobalt at $2 a week. What we're actually saying is that don't buy African cheap African cobalt, buy Canadian cobalt, because we want to actually um, we want to actually excuse me. Um, there was I'm I'm, near, I'm using a um, a shared connection because uh, there's construction near near my place and uh, there's so much noise near where near, near where I am. Um, so. Basically, this is a very, very delicate situation we, that we have in Canada when we come to the issue of climate protection and uh, the, the exploitation of resources in the north. And in 2018, on the basis of the protection of the, of the environment, the, the Canadian government has imposed a moratorium on any new uh, plans to exploit uh, natural resources in the north, which is north of the 60th parallel uh, in, in Canada. The basis of this, once again, is protection of the environment and uh, the fight against climate change. But it also prevents foreign powers from acquiring stakes in local, or I would say, Canadian exploitation um, uh, endeavors. So it is very, very, um, it, it is not exactly 
it is it's it is a sort of policy dance i would say because it's full of contradictions on the one hand canada wants to demonstrate sovereignty in the north on the other hand it forbids itself from doing that by forbidding itself from exploiting the resources that are there so it, it's a policy dance which is very very much based on the liberal party's contradictions and the more the liberal party does this the more it actually alienates the west of the country where most of the mining is done alberta north of alberta most of these exploitations are north of alberta where we have a large conservative uh, nodule so the arctic policy of canada is actually tearing at the fabric of society i wouldn't say of society but tearing at the fabric of the political system in canada and the liberal party doesn't seem to care too much which is which is not surprising because they don't need the west to win uh, the next election but what is surprising is that at the same time they are very 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 much uh serious about uh, demonstrating sovereignty but they are forbidding themselves from doing that um so this moratorium will endure probably until a conservative government is elected, which is not for tomorrow, I, I guess. We are in a very, very fractious situation right now. And it seems to me that um, we have a, um, a situation where for the longest time, I think the north, northern route north of Russia will remain the primary means of getting to Asia. Uh, rather than uh, the Northwest Passage in Canada. There's always one, isn't there? I think it's Stevie Wonder driving that car. I'm sorry if you can't hear it. Um, so um, it seems to me that um, the, the prospect for cooperation will remain within the Arctic Council, which Russia now is leading. And... It must be leading it quite well. How do we know? Because we hear zero about Russia in the, uh, in, the, in the media about the Arctic Council. So probably your diplomacy is very, very effective, very, very, I would say, um, recognizable to other Arctic Council members uh, in its methods. And uh, the point is, the, this is the preferred method that Canada wants to engage in partnership. So far, the Arctic Council's main issue is environmental protection, of course, but it is also aimed at preserving the sanctity of the Nuuk Treaty from 2011, which is, um, which is um, basically deciding um, all matters of search and rescue and um, uh, the division of labors in these areas. So... For now, we will maintain a relationship based on the Arctic Council because we love multilateralism. Everybody's, everybody has to play with the same rules, more or less. And uh, in that respect, we should be... Excuse me. They're not from here. Um, so in that respect, I think... The, with regards to Arctic relations, uh, we will remain in the status quo and rather harmonious relations. There, is, there remains one issue which is as important to Russia as to Canada. It is the presence of NATO in the Arctic. A sine qua non aspect of, I would say, good relations with Russia would be the absence of NATO in the Arctic. Now, Russians, certain Russians would say, but NATO is in the Arctic because we have Denmark, because we have Canada, because we have Russia, uh, we have the United States, uh, and we have, of course. And I would say, no, these are the United States, Norway, D Denmark, and Canada. This is not NATO. These are not NATO navies. These are national navies. And those national navies, uh, they, some national navies had to ask permission to go through the Northwest Passage because it is a disputed area and uh, many countries deem it it's a strait. We say these are internal waters and there's good grounds to say that these are internal waters. But that means that uh, the, the largest, I would say the largest swath of, um, of territory, uh, of maritime territory in the Arctic is actually 
controlled by Canada or by the Canadian Navy. That's the Canadian Navy, not the Canadian NATO Navy, not the NATO Canadian Navy. It's the Canadian Navy. And it's, it's a very small Navy, as you all know, very poorly equipped. Everybody's complaining about it. But we are absolutely adamant that unless there's an Article 5 situation, no NATO in the Arctic. And so that, that is a sine qua non uh, condition, which is a factor that should actually bring closer uh, Russia and Canada. I think I should stop here. I think I've been speaking for 15 minutes. I think I should stop here. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Fred, and thank you very much for uh, saying if uh, Russia is not mentioned in the in the press, that then that means that Russia is doing things right. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I was told that uh, Alexei Petrov has joined us, but uh, for some reason he cannot uh, uh, join us, he cannot connect. He wanted to ask a question. Alexei, are you with us? If not, uh, then uh, we'll go back to him a little bit later, and uh, maybe it's time for us to start a Q&A. Uh, Alexei Petrov has uh, just joined us. He's with us. Hello, Alexei. We cannot see you. That's why I was concerned. I don't know which Petrov it is. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> no, it's not the one I know. Hello, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we have been talking about the development of the Northern Sea Route and the Ministry for Transportation created the uh, Directorate for International Transportation Corridors. From the standpoint of the Ministry of uh, Transportation, let's talk about the Northern uh, um, Passages or Corridors. How promising is this for, for us, do you think? I would refrain from exact uh, estimates because we can see that the infrastructure is only uh, developing, is only evolving, and we see that there is information that says what is uh, happening there, in what direction this development is going, what number of uh, icebreakers would be needed and can be uh, had there in order to ensure that uh, there is unobstructed access uh, through the Northern Sea Route. So uh, I cannot give you an exact uh, answer, but if we know that uh, if something is uh, loaded on, onto a ship in Murmansk and then goes through the uh, Arctic Ocean and uh, goes to China, Geographically, this is much closer than to use the uh, Suez Canal. And uh, this is something that should be used, without a doubt. But I'd like to say that the risks, infrastructure risks, that we know of uh, cannot be properly analyzed. I can even tell you that most likely the Russian Federation uh, will try to... Uh, ensure that its own domestic Northern Sea Route is uh, operating uh, without any interruptions. But as, as we uh, know, I mean, there are climatic uh, situations that can arise. What happened in Germany, the floods there, that's something that nobody expected to see. So nature is unpredictable. And therefore, if the question was a two-part question, whether it's good or not, I would say this is good, but how well this would be perceived by the business community, whether this will be in demand. Uh, ultimately, it's someone who pays the money who would have to calculate all of the risks that are in here and there, and they would have to calculate what are the pros and cons. And if the pro of using this route exceeds the risks that are present there, then that would uh, work for them. Conversely, if they realize that the risks are much worse or much higher than the uh, income that he would be able to generate, then they would uh, say no to this. That's my answer. When the infrastructure catches up, when it is uh, ready to uh, 
uh, support the interests of the business community in an adequate way, uh, bringing the risk to a standard level that uh, uh, exists. Sometimes uh, we have uh, hitches and hiccups uh, on the railroads too, and they are fixed very quickly. And so when the risks are similar here, then of course, uh, this route will become more in demand, very much sold after. Thank you very much, Alexei. As a follow-up to what you've said uh, at the uh, roundtable together with Dmitry Tonkin uh, last year, one of the experts, uh, Alexander Golovizin, said back then that uh, the theory says that there is demand for the Northern Sea Route, but there is a need for someone who would risk and invest. Ross Adam said they were ready to... Uh, to invest, but at the last moment, Ross Adam Cargo decided not to participate. Maybe that was too daring at the time. And now I would like to give um, the floor back to Anna Garokova. I would like to use the right of the moderator and ask my first question. Uh, but uh, one of the questions I had was uh, uh, taken over by someone from our audience. China has uh, shown interest in uh, using and developing northern the Northern Sea Route. Do you see any hidden challenges in developing this uh, kind of uh, cooperation and uh, mm, certainly I would like to ask uh, you, uh, Pavel Gudev, to give us your comment. Yes, I have a very good um, idea about this. When you open uh, China's uh, white book, uh, its policy, everything seems to be very peaceful, but the devil is in the details, as we all know. China has declared that they are a near Arctic state. I don't know what criteria they used to determine that. Well, how different it is from, you know, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, uh, Poland, um, or other nations, they could say that. But even France is saying that we used to have a whole uh, swathe of um, researchers that were that they were discoverers and they found uh, islands in the Arctic. So they are the near polar uh, nation. And uh, China is now also saying that there is no other country in the world that uh, uh, violates uh, the uh, uh, convention uh, of the law of the sea in the uh, South China Sea, including innocent passage and uh, operation in the exclusive economic zone, uh, plus um, the recognition of uh, air traffic across, uh, and they, the list can be continued. But China is telling us that the key regulator is the Convention of the Law of the Sea of 1982. And this the, that's the only law, as if there hadn't been any other Russian or Soviet time uh, legislation. They're also saying that they are supporting the freedom of navigation in the Arctic. We should ask them. What kind of freedom of navigation are you supporting and where we understand that our legal regime in the Northern Sea Route is uh, certainly a slight uh, restriction on the freedom of navigation. And there are reasons, legal reasons why we're doing this. But China's position is uh, quite paradoxical because they are in violation of many rules in breach of many rules. But uh, it looks like uh, their position is very similar to the position of the United States, who are contesting the position of China in the South Asia, South China Sea. So it's very contradictory, and we have to be very careful with this partner. Thank you so much. And I'd like to address the same question to Pavel Ivankin. Pavel, what is China's interest uh, in transit through Russia and whether we should uh, take the cargoes that we're already passing through our land routes to the um, Northern Sea Route. How promising is it? China doesn't like to put eggs into the same basket and uh, using transit, um, using the Great Silk Road through Kazakhstan and Trans-Siberian Road is something that creates competing routes and they are not uh, uh, obsessed with just one one route. And the Northern Sea Route uh, is something that China has been showing their interest toward. But I would like to say that um, their emphasis is not on the transit potential of uh, the 
and SR, although it can be considered as well and used, but it's more um, that of uh, a route that provides access to the natural riches, uh, natural uh, mineral resources that Russia has to optimize their delivery, including gas and coal um, from the mines uh, that will be developed there. And uh, the infrastructure uh, in, inside Russia is well developed. And uh, I'm sure that they're interested in uh, seeing this one is developed as well. Okay, I understood your answer. Thank you very much. And the next question should be addressed to Harald Moon. The presence of uh, NATO in the Arctic is something that uh, Frederick Labar mentioned, and he um, made the right emphasis in, in that assessment of his. This is not an easy topic, because uh, in, in the media, uh, any tensions uh, in the Arctic are always uh, looked at through a magnifying glass and are debated quite uh, passionately. But he said that the Navy that is there, that is not NATO's Navy, it's the navies of the countries that are part of the bloc. What is uh, your opinion, Arlt? Uh, what is NATO thinking about these rules that Frederick spoke about? And that uh, to get uh, authorization uh, to get to get through the Northwestern Passage for military ships is necessary as uh, it is uh, uh, the rule uh, in the Northern Sea route. What is the West's opinion of these rules, which seem quite uh, logical to us, the countries that are coastal countries? As far as I know, this is uh, 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 this is something that uh, uh, is related to uh, the interpretation of Russia's uh, role in the Arctic uh, and the status of the Straits. The United States are the only ones that are against uh, that status. The other countries were not that opposed to that, but in principle, they are uh, supportive of the idea that these are international straits, but this is not a hot topic. This means that uh, the business community, that commercial companies uh, regard these rules and these uh, controversies uh, as something that's not really that important in practical terms. They do recognize Russia's regulation and administration of the Northern Sea Route. So it's not a hard topic, it's not a, an acute issue. But if we uh, look forward um, into the future, if there's a lot of interest uh, toward transit, then this question could become more relevant. Uh, but I would also like to add that when we talk about uh, transit, we need to understand uh, what kind of scale of transit we are talking about. Uh, it's not a question of, uh, uh, you know, opposing this to the Suez Canal or zero transit. It's a big question. It's hard to imagine what it's going to be like going forward. There's going to be a uh, an uptake in transit, but a major uh, volume uptake is not something that I predict. Can I ask a quick question for Fred? We once discussed this matter. It happens uh, so that Russia and China have a lot of common issues in, in the Arctic. The largest territories uh, of the two nations, you have the Northwestern Passage, we have the no Northern Sea Route, you also have uh, issues and challenges with the indigenous populations. How possible uh, is it possible uh, for Russia and Canada to cooperate on these key issues? I believe that the two Arctic uh, nations uh, have a uh, major part of their territory uh, close to the Arctic. They need to cooperate uh, much closer than they have been. Uh, this is a question from an analyst, not an official person. Thank you very much uh, for the question, Igor. I'm definitely not an expert on uh, issues of indigenous relations. Don't forget that 
in the Northwest Territories alone, the, the size of the Northwest Territories as a territory is about the same size as the whole of Scandinavia. So, of course, you're Russian, so you understand that scale. Um, but there's a, less than 25,000 people living there. So what kind of, in terms of, uh, of cooperation, I think it might actually be to, to Russia's detriment because our indigenous populations are very, very activist in, in Canada, demanding new rights, de demanding reconciliation, de demanding reparations to which they're owed, I have to say, uh, against depredations and abuses of prior, prior centuries and prior governments as well. Um, ask yourself if you want to alarm or alert your own uh, indigenous population in the north to such um, to such issues. I I'm not an expert on say Soviet official or even Russian imperial official relations with your indigenous population in the north, uh, but it is certainly um, it it. it it may encounter the same challenges. It, it may have been the ground for the same challenges and, of course, the same grievances today uh, as, as we have encountered in Canada. So can you imagine if uh, you have cooperation across the North Pole between your indigenous population and our indigenous populations? What will happen is that you'll have a some sort, you may have a conglomerate of indigenous uh, communities coming together, uh, maybe leveraging the UN, and we know they do that already. So not, maybe not the northern communities, but the uh, the aboriginal communities in Canada actually go to the UN and lobby hard and embarrass the Canadian government very, very well. Um, so can you imagine if indigenous or northern or Eskimo or uh, Inuit communities got together and started embarrassing uh, Russia at the UN Security Council or something like this. So um, the, the feeling would be, from the Russian point of view, that this would need to be managed. Then what would be the Russian official reputation or the, 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 the Russian official image as it tries to do this? It will only make matters worse for, for the central government, I would say. Uh, and not to say that this is not something that on a cultural basis that should not be done. But how do you limit it just to culture? How do you limit it to um, issues of local, um, issues of education and development? How do you limit it to administrative issues and do not uh, prevent it from spinning out of control of the central government into a national, well, I wouldn't say a national crisis. In Canada, we have a national crisis right now. Uh, we have a national crisis uh, due to the fact that there were se severe abuses in residential schools. That also includes northern schools and uh, all over the country. So would your government be willing to be tested by that? That's, that's a big question. Uh, just to underscore also the issue of NATO navies, once again, uh, I think Mr. Murray is uh, absolutely right. Uh, when uh, commercial traffic goes onto the Northwest Passage, it's an, an it's an administrative issue. It's not like the country has to present a letter of patent. Please let us go through. No, it's an administrative issue. It's a rubber stamp, and it's authorized. On the few occasions the United States have not asked this administrative permission, uh, the last one was in 1986. And it caused a, a great issue between the two countries. So, of course, it's, it is uh, it is not as uh, severe as I intended to explain, uh, as I intended to illustrate. But um, um, and it is uh, related to the issue of innocent passage. You're absolutely right. I'll just stop there. I, it's probably not a satisfactory answer to Igor. Uh, maybe you want to see her something more positive. But uh, in Canada right now. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't look good, at least, in, in, that, res, in that respect. Thank you so much, Fred, actually. A negative answer is also an answer. This is better than anything, than nothing. And we are joined by Yelena, 
from the Ministry of Natural Protection and Natural Resources, Yelena Yesina. Can you hear us? Something wrong with the connection. Okay, I'm passing the floor to Anna. There was one more question, as far as I understand. There was a question to Pavel Gudev about uh, uh, the heavy fuel ban. Our audience is very much interested whether it means that Russia is not ready for the clean energy or clean fuel vessels. And are there any deadlines until which we can have to solve that question? Well, actually, I'm not in the position to answer that question. This uh, project was uh, promoted by WWF, and uh, we have to turn to them with a the question whether this initiative is good or to detriment. And uh, protecting the maritime environment, that's very good. And if you don't do anything about that, uh, you will become a marginal actor internationally. But uh, sometimes it is used for competition. Well, Usually, I'm asking a question why we are not concerned about the Suez Canal and uh, the, oh, the Panama Canal, for instance, so why this question is not raised. But this is a rhetorical question. Anna, anything else? We're, we're working for an hour. That was a very interesting roundtable, very busy one, probably. We have to wrap it up, and I will say a few words, and uh, then I will pass the baton over to you. So that's another round table discussion and uh, it is dedicated to the northern sea route and i have an interesting feeling or perception as a person who is monitoring that problem we'll understand the potential and the capacity we say that international transit is not very much possible despite um, high profile statements and despite uh, the all the prospects uh, it may contribute to the development of the russian economy and the northern territories but we are missing the impetus we are missing the impetus and uh, in terms of really creating a global concept and i'm very much uh, worrying about uh, uh, the project uh, outlined by Dmitry Tomkin setting up a uh, number of hubs along the Northern Sea Route. This is something of my concern, and uh, I doubt that it will materialize. But in the upcoming year and a half or two years that uh, Russia is uh, chairing the Arctic Council, if we can actually uh, highlight that problem uh, from a different angle, not just uh, transporting or carrying our goods uh, to China, but uh, if we can portray that as something different, then probably we can succeed. Well, thank you, Igor. Thank you, dear participants on the discussion. Thank you for your time. And I would say that it was a brief but a very thorough analysis of the Northern Sea Route capacity, whether it makes sense and whether it has a future. We will continue that discussion in the future because this topic is burning for today and tomorrow, so we'll be glad to see you once again. And on behalf of uh, Gorchakov Fund, I'd like to thank our permanent partners, uh, the uh, Project Office for Arctic Development. And I just think along with that office, we'll continue the discussion of the Arctic Cooperation. High on the agenda are social issues, uh, the indigenous peoples issues, and so we'll be glad to see you once again and thanks so much for your participation and we actually we are holding an arctic dialogue by the way yes the arctic dialogue this is another topic and uh, please join us uh, the we will start collecting the applications uh, shortly and thank you so much uh, for your interest Especially, I'd like to thank the young political scientists and young reporters from different countries of the Arctic nations. Thank you so much, the experts. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the Gorchakov Fund for the opportunity to take part in the discussion and take care. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Yes. Okay. Bye, Fred. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you. Pavel, see you again. Bye-bye, Anna. Bye-bye, Anastasia.